Hello everybody, Professor Gassimi here, and in this component of the lecture, we're going to be giving an overview of the Hypertext Transmission Protocol, or HTTP. So let's start off by reminding everybody that the World Wide Web really consists of three core elements. There's HTTP, there's URLs, and there's HTML. These are the three kind of core elements. HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and that defines how data moves between a host computer and a receiving computer. It's the formalities, not the infrastructure, but the formalities of how the data is exchanged. The second thing is the URL, or a uniform resource locator, which we discussed. That's the basically the identity of particular content that you're interested in receiving from a server if you are a client. And the third and final piece is hypertext markup language, or HTML. And that defines the rules for how to format the documents when you want to send them from the server back to the client, right? Because if you wanted to read a document, you have to have agreed upon um, uh, syntax and formatting. Now, don't worry about the HTML piece here. We're going to be speaking about the nuts and bolts uh, from a programming perspective on how you build HTML as well as CSS next week. For this lecture, we're going to be focusing just on HTTP. OK, so as I mentioned, it's a protocol for sharing document-based resources. This includes HTML documents, but it could also include videos, images, and other things. And um, it provides communication between clients and servers through what are called requests. And uh, when the server sends information back, that is called a response. Now, just to be clear, HTTP can be used for communication between any kind of client and server. It doesn't just have to be a web browser. It could be a, um, a script that you write in Python. You can have it make HTTP requests. In fact, there's a really nice library called requests in Python that allow you to uh, make these HTTP requests. It's a, great, it's a great thing if you wanted to, for example, build a scraper or a web crawler or something of that kind. And the servers. Um, could be uh, any kind of server in any part of the planet. There's no restrictions to what you can access when you're using HTTP insofar as the server ultimately has an, an HTTP, um, it, it accepts HTTP style requests. So what is the request response cycle? Well, it goes sort of in four steps. First, the client sends an HTTP request to the server. In the second step, the server processes this um, by running usually an application of some kind, Flask, Node.js, uh, could be something else. And then it just responds. And it says, hey, here you go. Here's what you asked for. And uh, the client, in this case, the mobile phone, receives it and processes it with their browser. Now, there are a couple of essential elements of HTTP that I think actually make it a pretty nice uh, scheme. The first one is that it is. It's actually pretty simple, and it's human readable. Okay, I've got an example HTTP request there on the right-hand side, and we're going to dissect one of these um, a little bit later. But you can see that that is an actual HTTP request uh, that was made, and it's not kind of crazy difficult, even without me explaining it, to understand what's going on. It's also designed to be extensible, so you can take HTTP, and you can add other components to it, special headers uh, and things that we'll speak about a little bit later. It's stateless uh, by default. So when you make one request to Google.com followed by another request to Google.com, Google returns the same information. Uh, there's exceptions to this, of course, because you can uh, record history using HTTP cookies. But out of the box, HTTP is, is, uh, is stateless. Right? It doesn't assume that it has access to the state. And uh, it's a layer of communication on top of TCP, which is um, obviously that distinct framework that is what allows the communications to happen. It's distinct from the application, which is HTTP. What HTTP controls is um, caching that happens on websites. This helps with optimization. It helps with authentication to protect pages um, so that only people who are authorized to access them can access them. It can be used for proxy and uh, tunneling services so that if you need to access information on a private network, going through a proxy like a firewall, you can do that by HTTP. And it also handles sessions so that you can actually keep track of the state 
of a person as they walk through various web pages. This is how Amazon keeps track of your shopping basket, as an example, or uh, Facebook tracks you um, that plus cookies throughout the web and so on. So we'll speak about some of these other components of it probably toward the tail end of the course. But again, knowing these things right up at the front will give you this complete picture, I hope, of how each of these components um, that make up the internet work and interact. So what are the HTTP request types, right? Well, you know, what, what can HTTP request? Well, there are a whole lot of them, but the most common ones and the ones you're going to be dealing with in this course are really two. There's get requests. This is um, when the URL is submitted in the browser location bar. When a user clicks a link, it's usually a get request. And then there's post requests. These are what are sent when a user fills out a web form and clicks submit. Okay, That's basically the difference between the two. I think the best way to have this become concrete is to go through an actual example of an HTTP get request. So let's say that we were interested in fetching the HTML from www.opera.com. And let's also say that we opened up our terminal and we established a, um, a TCP connection to opera.com using Telnet. This, by the way, uh, Telnet opera.com 80 is an actual command you can run on your command line, not just to opera.com, but to google.com or any other web asset. And once you've actually established that connection, you can run HTTP requests, right? So the first thing you would do if you wanted to write an HTTP request is you'd write what kind of request you want to make. In this case, we're interested in, in a, get, a get request. We want to fetch the contents in the root directory of opera.com. OK, and because we want the contents of the root directory, we're going to put slash. That's in the kind of Unix notation. Slash means sort of root directory, right? So that's what the second slash means. The third thing that we'll tell the web server is which version of HTTP we are using, because there's multiple versions. It's an evolving protocol. And so if we're going to make a request, the specific syntax might change depending on the version. And so we want to specify that. We then click Enter, and we would say, well, what's the specific host I'm trying to reach? So we put host colon, and then we just put the website's name. And if you click Enter twice after you do that on your command line, uh, insofar as the server actually accepts your request uh, and responds, uh, then you'll get a message that looks something like this. The server will tell you, well, hey, I'm also using um, HTTP 1.1, and I respond in that um, HTTP system a status code 200. And 200 is the status code that maps to OK, which means, yep, no problem. I heard your request loud and clear. I'm happy to send you back the information you asked for. We're going to talk about some of the other status codes here in a minute, too. It would then send you back a series of HTTP headers. And these um, describe what the message is and how it should be understood. So in the case of this particular example, this message was sent on Wednesday, the 23rd, 2011, GMT. The server that sent it was an Apache server. And what he's sending back is HTML text in the following character encoding, UTF-8. Okay, So he's telling you things that are might be important for what they're about to send back later. Finally, would give you, then after that, the HTML document that you requested at the root directory. And this actually gets printed to your screen. So Making an HTTP request is not um, something that is, is crazy difficult. As I mentioned, you can telnet to an address. You can write the HTTP request with your own two hands, and you will get the HTTP response as well as um, the document that you requested. Now, in the previous slide, we had that response, and there was a code, right? There was that 200 that said OK. Well, as you make HTTP-style requests, um, there are a set of there are a large number of these status codes that could get returned when there are those communications between the client as well as and the server, and they basically come in five categories. The first ones are the 100 codes, and these basically mean that um, the server is thinking through your request, so it hasn't made a decision yet. There's 200 codes, which basically means that the request was successfully completed. 
There's 300 level codes, which uh, basically means they they got you and they sent you to someone else. Okay, they redirected you to another page or another server. There's 400 level codes, which means that there was an error on your part, meaning you requested something that didn't exist or there was a problem with the way you formatted, for example, your HTTP request. And then there's 500 level codes, which means that there was an error on the server's part, not your part, but on their part. They they broke, they failed somehow, and they, they couldn't help you because um, something broke on their end. So what are the most important HTTP status codes? If you're going to remember any of them, I would suggest the set of um, seven or so on the left, 200, which we already saw is OK. 301 is permanent redirect. 302 is temporary redirect. 404 is not found. 410 is gone. 500 is internal server error. And 503 is service unavailable. Some of these you've probably actually encountered as you've surfed the web. So for example, if you go to Yelp and you type in www.yelp.com slash and then put in some nonsense as I showed you there on the right-hand side of the screen, you get a 404 error. Why? Well, it's a 400 level code because I, the client who made this request, gave them nonsense. I asked them for an asset that didn't exist. And so they responded back with a 400 level code. And specifically, the 400 level code was 404, meaning I didn't find anything in my um, file directory for AJFAFJWWA. It's, there's no such thing. Okay, So when you're making your um, requests through the browser, the browser is turning those requests in the URL into HTTP requests. And you know then it gets responses back. And it parses those responses into what you're seeing. And that's the reason why you end up seeing this uh, 404 error here, because the browser sort of sits in the middle and is handling a lot of this stuff in the back. But as you're developing your web application, it's important you know this, because you'll, you'll start encountering some of these as you, as you get through. OK, well, another part of the um, HTTP response, and it could also exist in a request, of course, is, is the headers, right? So in the example that we showed earlier, um, the server responded back with the 200 code OK, and then it gave us some headers, and then finally it returned the HTML content. OK, there are dozens of headers um, that you can uh, explore and use to explore resources, interpret, uh, and test requests. Um, you can check an HTTP response header by going to uh, redbot.org. And you can view a full list of HTTP headers here at the website I've listed on the second bullet point. So in conclusion, what I want you to take away from here is that HTTP is a simple, extensible protocol that's easy to interpret. I definitely don't want you to be intimidated by HTTP requests. I want you to have confidence that you can make them on your own, even without a browser if you needed to. Um, uh, and that you could even potentially maybe extend HTTP. Uh, it is a protocol for sharing document-based resources. That's HTML, images, and so on. Uh, the client is what initiates these HTTP requests. That's your browser. And the server is what shares a response based on that. There is a defined structure of HTTP requests and responses that allows for communication between the clients and servers on top of TCP.